Fantastic. So I've just clicked start. So hopefully we've got lots of students joining. I can see at the bottom of my screen, we've got lots of you joining now. So welcome everyone. Um, we'll give you a few seconds um, to, to join us, but uh, my name's Freddie. I'm here from Team Unifrog and really excited to introduce you guys to today's session, um, which is all about oceanography um, and earth sciences. Um, so uh, yeah, really, really pleased to have you here. Um, and we're really pleased as well to have Dr. Esther Sumner, who's going to be delivering uh, a bit of a subject taster over the next half an hour. Um, and then we've also got Stephanie here, you'll see as a student ambassador and also Sean, a recent graduate as well. Um, so it's amazing to see over 60 of you here. So I think we're going to get started pretty much right away. But one thing I really wanted to flag to everyone here um, is that we do have this Q&A function that I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with um, from the past. So please do use that to post your questions right across the session. Um, and we'll do our best to answer those um, towards the end. Um, and I think, I think that's it. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Esther. Okay, thank you very much. I'll just get my slides up. Okay, so I hope that you can see uh, my slides. Let me just get a pointer. Okay, so welcome to this webinar, Explore Ocean and Earth Science with the University of Southampton. So um, as Freddie introduced, my name's Esther Sumner and I'm an associate professor here in the School of Ocean and Earth Science at Southampton. And I'm also the admissions tutor for geology and environmental geoscience undergraduate degrees. So in terms of what we've got in store for you today, we've got an introduction to what is geoscience. So probably this isn't something you've actually had the opportunity to study before. I'll talk a little bit about what it's like to study here in Southampton. And then I'll go into what next. So what kind of careers can you go into with a degree in geoscience? And during that part of the talk, um, Sean will actually talk about his experiences studying here in Southampton and also what he's gone on to do next. And then we'll have a question and answer session at the end where hopefully we can try to answer lots of those questions that you've got. And also hopefully my email address will get put in the chat. So if any questions come up for you after today, then please just drop me an email. So let's start off with what is geoscience? So at the most basic level, geoscience is the study of the whole earth system. So that's the land, the oceans, the atmosphere, the interior of our planet, and how all these things are interconnected. And so as geoscientists, we actually study the past, the present, and the future of our planet. And we also even study other planets within our solar system. So a key area in which geoscientists are involved is actually in finding solutions to the challenges that are facing us and facing our planet. And so that's what I'm largely gonna talk about in this part of the talk. I'll give you an introduction to how a geoscientist really uh, trying to find solutions to climate change and to understand climate change in the past, the present and the future. Uh, we'll look at how geoscientists are involved in finding sustainable energy solutions. And we'll also look at how geoscientists are involved in protecting populations from geohazards. So let's start with climate change in the past, in the present and in the future. So you've all probably seen graphs like this one before. So what this is showing you is how global temperatures have actually increased by over 1.2 degrees Celsius since the pre-industrial era here, all the way to the present day here. And so this obviously has impacts for us. So we have increased extreme weather events as we're seeing in Scotland today. Uh, we have uh, increased heat waves, droughts, and this is also causing rising sea levels due to uh, uh, expansion of seawater and also melting of ice sheets and adding water into the oceans. And so this is giving you an idea of actually what does that look like on the face of our planet. So here is the Engerbreen Glacier in Norway in 1889. So that's towards the beginning of this time series here. And so you can see this Victorian gentleman surveying the landscape and you can see that there's this glacier basically coming all the way down the valley and he's sitting on this these boulders here. If we fast forward to 2010 then we've got another uh, person sitting looking at this view but this time they're sat basically just on the edge of sort of a lush forest, and there's very little of that glacier left to be seen. So this is really what those, those uh, sort of global rising temperatures look like uh, on our planet today. So you're all probably also pretty familiar with uh, why we've got these rising global temperatures. It's because we've got increased amounts of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And so carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and we're causing this rise in global temperatures. And the reason we've got more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is because we're doing things like burning fossil fuels, we're making things like cement, which produce lots of carbon dioxide as a byproduct, and we're cutting down lots of trees. 
You might have also seen climate deniers say things to you like, but surely global temperatures have changed throughout Earth's history. And as I'll show you in the next few slides, yes, that is absolutely true that global temperatures have changed through Earth's history, but they've not changed at the alarming rate that we're seeing in the present day. So this is an example of that. So this, is, uh, this photograph here is showing you Antarctica today. So we can see icebergs and we can see penguins. And this uh, uh, artist's impression is showing you Antarctica 120 million years ago, these warm temperate forests. And the reason that we know that Antarctica looked like this 120 million years ago is that we can go to the rocks that are poking out of the Antarctic ice sheet and we can look at the fossils in those rocks and we see fossils like this. So this is a fossilized leaf from a tree fern. And this gives us evidence about what the environment was like and the fact that it was much warmer back in the Cretaceous 120 million years ago. And so as geoscientists, we actually have tools to understand how is climate change throughout the history of the Earth. And so the main way that we do this as geoscientists is we go out on research vessels like this one. So this is a research vessel with this big drilling rig. So we can then drill down beneath the seafloor into the sediments and rocks that lie beneath. And so if we look in those marine sediments of rocks, we find these tiny little fossils like this one here. So this is much, much smaller than that leaf. So it's a tenth of a millimetre for scale. And this is basically a microfossil uh, called a foraminifera. And it's basically a, a, a microscopic creature, actually an al so microscopic organism, I should say. So an algae that lived in the surface waters of the oceans. And when it died, it sank to the seafloor and it got incorporated into those layers of sediment. So we can take these microfossils and we can take them back to the lab, a lab like this one, and we can measure their chemistry and we can measure their isotopic composition. And from that, we can understand actually how temperatures have changed on Earth, on the Earth throughout Earth's history. And we can also look at isotopes to understand actually how have carbon dioxide levels changed uh, on the surface of the Earth throughout Earth's history. And so from this evidence, we see that throughout Earth's history, when we have high carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, then we have high temperatures. So that was the case back in the uh, Cretaceous 120 million years ago, we had much higher carbon dioxide levels. Or for example, you might be familiar with the fact that at the last ice age, so maybe we go back 25,000 years, we see that we've got much lower carbon dioxide levels and we have um, a much colder climate. The other really neat thing that we can do from this type of data is we can understand the rate of, ch of temperature change. And so what we find is that current global temperatures are changing at an absolutely alarming rate. So they're changing at probably the fastest rates in uh, Earth history. Uh, the only sort of comparably fast rates of temperature change in Earth history are when catastrophic events like this happen. So this is 66 million years ago when a meteorite hit the surface of the Earth. It rapidly changed temperatures and it wiped out 76% of species on our planet, including things like the dinosaurs. So this isn't an ideal situation. So if anyone ever says to you, but surely global temperatures have changed throughout Earth's history, the answer is yes, they have, but absolutely not at this rate. So you'll probably also be familiar with the Paris Agreement of 2015. So the Paris Agreement is that we should try to keep global temperatures from rising less than two degrees Celsius above what they were in pre-industrial times. And if we want to do this, then it requires two things. We have to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide emissions that we're putting into the atmosphere. But that's not enough. We also have to transition to actively taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides. So geoscientists are heavily involved in finding sustainable energy solutions. So these types of energy solutions could be things like the wind farm that you can see in this slide. They could be geothermal energy. They could be, uh, for example, trying to get uh, energy out of tides, so tidal energy, uh, or for example, hydroelectric power. And there's many ways in which geoscientists are involved with this. And I'm just going to show you uh, one example. Um, so this is something colleagues are involved with. So here you can see a wind farm that's being built out at sea, but th th this is relevant if we were building a wind farm on land also. And so what you're looking at here is basically a cross section through what the earth looks like beneath the sea floor. And this is something which we can measure as geoscientists. And we can do this using a thing called geophysics. So geophysics is basically just using physics to understand what the earth looks like. And so we can use geophysical techniques to actually make images of what the earth uh, beneath the ground looks like. And so in this case, the way we do that is we send sound pulses from a boat in this case 
And those sound pulses, when we send them down to, into the earth, they might bounce off different layers, so bounce off the seafloor or bounce off different layers beneath the seafloor. And so what you're looking at in this cross section here, this, uh, this is the seafloor here. And this really wiggly line is showing you where rocks are beneath the seafloor. And these colored layers are the loose sediments above those rocks. So it's really important if you want to build a wind turbine, that you put the foundation of that wind turbine into rock. If you put it into loose sediment, it's rather likely to fall over, which is not, not ideal. The other thing which geoscientists are involved in is once we've built a wind farm, we need to know actually what is that wind farm doing to the seafloor. And so in this slide, you can see this yellow instrument that's getting towed behind a, a ship. And this is the bottom of a wind turbine here. And actually what they're doing is they're surveying actually what do the sediments on the seafloor here look like? How have they been affected by that uh, wind turbine? Have they packed very big piles of sediment? Have they scoured out? And also what are the impacts on things like the animals that are living in that area on the seafloor? So as I mentioned, another thing which we need to do if we want to meet the Paris Agreement is to actually actively take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So you might well be familiar with this idea of carbon capture and storage, which is shown in this uh, diagram. So if this is a factory here, what would usually happen is this factory might pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, but we really want to stop that from happening. So what we can do is rather than releasing that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we can trap it and then we can bury it somewhere else. So one of the main ways that we are involved in doing this as geoscientists is we can actually bury that carbon dioxide beneath the Earth's surface in geological formations, so basically in porous rocks. And these are often actually where in the past we've extracted oil and gas from the subsurface. You might be less familiar with the fact that actually as geoscientists we're also responsible for, for making sure that that carbon dioxide doesn't then escape. Because we've just put a fluid into rocks beneath the Earth's surface, it's probably going to be buoyant and want to escape. So ways we can monitor this, if, if this is on land, then we can use satellites, for example, to actually measure, is there any excess carbon dioxide uh, coming off the surface of the Earth above where we've buried some carbon dioxide in the subsurface? Or if we're in the oceans, we could, for example, measure the pH uh, of the seawater, because if we have gas bubbles, so of carbon dioxide escaping into the seawater, then they're going to rapidly dissolve and decrease the pH of that water. So geoscientists are also involved in sort of monitoring what happens when we, we try to use these types of carbon capture solutions. But we also have some really neat tricks up our sleeve. So you might not be aware that we can actually turn carbon dioxide into rock. And if we turn it into rock, it's not going to escape. So the way we do this is we take rocks, so like basalts and peridotites. So basalt is a type of really fine grained volcanic rock. And then this pistachio colored stuff is peridotite, which is a type of rock that we find in the Earth's mantle. And so if we take those volcanic rocks and we react them with carbon dioxide, then we actually precipitate out these crystals. And so these crystals are actually carbonate minerals. And so this is something um, which is actually being tried at an industrial scale. So this example here in this cartoon is the CarbFix project, which some of my colleagues are involved with. So this is a project in Iceland where this is basically a geothermal energy plant here. And unfortunately, whilst geothermal energy is a green energy, you do produce some carbon dioxide in generating that energy. And it's really important we don't let that carbon dioxide end up in the atmosphere. So instead, we capture that carbon dioxide, mix it with uh, water, and then pump that deep beneath the earth. And this is in Iceland. So Iceland's on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Lots of volcanic rocks are available. And so basically, you pump that carbon dioxide charged water into the basalts beneath the geothermal energy plant and it turns, the carbon dioxide gets turned into crystals like this, it's locked away and it's not going to escape. So as geoscientists, we're really uh, involved in this, uh, in both the transition to sort of renewable energy solutions, but also in finding ways to actually take carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere and, and bury it somewhere safer. So one of the consequences that we have of rising global temperatures is that we have increased extreme weather events and we have rising sea levels. And obviously this is a particular problem, well, it's a problem globally, but it's a problem for the UK because we're an island nation, so we've got lots of coastline. So we have coastal hazards and geoscientists are involved in actually uh, understanding those coastal hazards. So one of the things that we do as geoscientists is we actually assess what assets are at risk. So for example, we might have things like power stations or even nuclear power stations on coastlines. And then we want to understand actually what, what are they at risk from? So for example, they might be at risk from exposure to waves. They might be at risk from tidal flooding. 
And then we also want to understand what does that bit of coastline look like? What's its geomorphology? Um, does it have cliffs, for example? And what's its geology? So what are the sediments and rocks made of? And what's their erosion potential? Are those cliffs likely to erode, get undercut and collapse? And we can start thinking about actually what types of defences do we need to put in place? And should we be putting defences in place? And so geoscientists are involved in shoreline management planning and also informing policymakers, basically giving policymakers options of what we might uh, choose to do. And so in terms of the types of techniques which um, geoscientists are using to understand coastal hazards, we might be collecting remote sensing data like this. We might be conducting seafloor surveys, so making maps of the seafloor. Or we might be conducting beach and cliff surveys on land. So for example, monitoring other cliffs actively moving, are they at risk from collapse? And so geoscientists don't just study coastal hazards, they study a wide range of natural hazards in order to protect people. So I've talked a little bit about coastal hazards. Geoscientists are also involved in understanding flooding. So that be, could be coastal flooding, but it could also be uh, flooding from rivers inland. We study landslides and uh, sediment avalanches. So this is actually what I do for my own research. And then um, I have colleagues who are involved in monitoring volcanic hazards. And I'll say a little bit about that in the next slide. Uh, and colleagues involved in understanding earthquakes, especially earthquakes at subduction zones, which are the earthquake, largest earthquakes that we have on our planet. And also you'll probably be aware that of sub subduction zone earthquakes, we also have this other hazard of, of tsunami, which can be absolutely devastating. So in terms of um, one of the ways in which uh, we consider volcanic hazards, these are some uh, figures from one of our PhD students. And you can see that, first of all, she's gone out into, oh, she's taken remote sensing data from this area, which has lots of volcanoes. This is actually from the East African Rift. And she's used this remote sensing data, so these basically these satellite images, to actually map out the different lava flows. You can see the different lava flows here. And then she's gone out into the field and she's collected rocks from those lava flows, and she's measured the chemistry of those rocks. And so then she can understand actually how old are those different lava flows and how frequently are these volcanoes erupting or how frequently did they erupt in the past. And she can also use the chemistry to understand actually what's the chemistry of that lava, what type of eruption occurred here. And then she's used that to create a map like this showing all of the different lava flows. And so she's built up this understanding of actually how frequently are lava flows occurring, what types of volcanic eruptions are happening, where's the next volcanic eruption likely to occur, and how do we actually then use that to actually protect populations in the area? So hopefully in this sort of whistle-stop tour, <coughs> uh, you've, you've sort of had a flavor of the types of problems we try to solve as geoscientists. And hopefully you've already started to see that kind of all, that we use lots of different areas of science to, to actually solve those problems. So we use things like geology, geography, biology, chemistry, maths and physics. So I'd imagine that hopefully you're studying some of these uh, subjects at the moment at A-level or equivalent. So to give you an idea, how, how uh, more of an idea of how we use these different uh, subjects in geoscience, then for example, I've spoken already that we can use physics to image what the um, uh, earth looks like beneath the surface. And I gave you the example of doing that if we were building a wind farm. But equally, we could do that, for example, at a subduction zone and actually image the downgoing tectonic plate and use that to better understand actually how do earthquakes work? How big is an earthquake likely to be in this area? So geology, geography. I mean, so in geography, you learn about what do modern landscapes look like? And we can use that information to really help us to interpret ancient landscapes in the geological record. And so, and that's a really powerful tool if we can look at actually how a landscape in a particular place has changed through time. So for example, we might have gone from there being a lake there at one point in time to being a desert at a later point in time. And then we can start asking questions like, well, actually, why did that occur? And how's that landscape likely to change going into the future? Biology is incredibly important for understanding the history of life on Earth. So that could be for understanding, you know, your charismatic megafauna like dinosaurs and mammals. But it could also be, for example, understanding those microfossils that I showed you, those uh, algae that had once lived in the surface waters of the ocean and then sunk to the seafloor. We can use chemistry, as I've shown, to actually understand uh, what's the chemical makeup, what's the isotopic composition of those microfossils, what does that tell us about how climate has changed throughout Earth's history. Or, for example, we could use chemistry to measure the chemistry of a volcanic rock at the surface of a volcano, 
And then we can use that chemistry of that rock to understand what's the chemistry of the magma chamber underneath. So how is that volcano likely to erupt? And how does that put populations at risk? <clears throat> so hopefully that gives you an idea of how, as geoscientists, we really integrate different areas of science in order to answer a uh, problem or to, uh, order to solve problems. And also, I mean, I'm fully aware that I doubt any of you have had the opportunity to study all of these subjects to uh, at, at A level, and we don't expect you to have. We just expect you to have a flavour of some of these subjects. And I think it's worth saying that actually doing a degree in geoscience is a really good way of getting a, a, a grounding in a really wide array of different science subjects. So I guess I'm going to move on now. So I've talked a bit, hope you've got an idea of what geoscience is, and I'm going to talk a bit more about what it's like to study here in Southampton. So the photograph that you can see here, this is our main campus in Southampton. But actually, as a, a, a geoscience student, you'll be based in the School of Ocean and Earth Science, which is this building here. So you can see we're down on the waterfront. And we're in a building called the National Oceanography Centre Southampton, which gets abbreviated to, to NOx. And so NOx is a leading European centre for ocean and earth sciences. We're actually home to the UK's research vessel fleet. So that's what you can see in this image here. This is one of the UK's ocean going research vessels. And so they get loaded and unloaded here. So actually we're also the home of uh, famous pieces of marine equipment like Boaty McBoatface, the little yellow submarine. So we're also, so we're a community of scientists and students linked by interdisciplinary studies. So that could be anything from marine biologists and oceanographers through to environmental geoscientists and geologists. We've got world-class teaching and research facilities. So we have some quite unusual teaching facilities. So for example, this is our survey vessel that we use for teaching. So if it's, for example, teaching oceanographic field skills and marine biology. And we're ranked in the top five in the UK for earth and ocean science research the last time that this was assessed. In terms of facilities, then we have state-of-the-art laboratories for teaching practical classes. So these are all very applied uh, degrees. So there's lots of practical skills that you need to pick up. We're home to the National Oceanographic Library, which is the largest oceanographic library in Europe. As I've already mentioned, we have some slightly unusual teaching facilities, so things like survey vessels. And also, so this building, the, in this building, the university owns over 100 different research laboratories like these ones here. And you might think, well, as an undergraduate, why does it matter what a university's research facilities are? But it really does, because so, for example, this is my uh, current second year class, and they've been down in our sediment dynamics research labs learning about sediment transport. Or, for example, this is an image I showed you earlier of a lab with a, a, a mass spectrometer in it, which can measure the isotopic composition of lots of different materials. And in the third and fourth year of your degree, you'll get the opportunity to do a piece of independent research. And it's then that you might work in laboratories like these. And then also, it's not all work. We do have nice places for our students to relax. So in terms of the degrees that we offer here in Southampton, uh, we have either geoscience degrees or degrees in marine biology uh, and also oceanography. Um, so in terms of what those geoscience degrees look like, we offer either uh, a degree in geology or a degree in environmental geoscience. And we offer either BSCs or MSIs. So a BSc, and this is true anywhere, any university, a BSc is a three-year degree, so a Bachelor of Science degree. An MSI is a four year degree, so it's an integrated master's degree. So what that means is that you're studying to an advanced level, to, so to a master's level, but you're doing that as an undergraduate student. And then on that environmental geoscience degree, we have either a geoscience or a marine pathway. So because of where we're based, you could choose either to be doing most of your learning, most of your field skills on land, or you could be choosing to do those at sea on the marine pathway. So in terms of uh, what uh, the types of ways in which you're studying on a degree, whether that's a geoscience degree or one of our other degrees, then you'll have taught modules. So you'll have lectures and practical classes. So you'll learn the theory content in your lectures, but then you'll apply it straight away the same week in your practical classes. There's lots of independent study with university degrees. So that could be reading around a subject uh, in between lectures and practical classes, or it could be like these students are doing that they've been given basically some data to work on or a problem to solve in between their classes. So these are very applied degrees. So there's lots of field work in our degrees. So for example, on a geology degree, you do up to 10 weeks of uh, field work over the course of your degree uh, with an environment to geoscience degree, that would be up to eight weeks. And then a really important component of our degrees is the fact that you get the opportunity to do an independent research project. So an original piece of research in the third or fourth year of your degree. 
So a question that I'm often asked as admissions tutor is, what is the difference between a degree in geology and a degree in environmental geoscience? And so at the most basic level, geology focuses on the physical earth system, whereas environmental geoscience is focusing on human interactions with the earth system. So in the next couple of slides, what I've done is kind of list the types of modules that you could choose to study on a geology degree and then on an environmental geoscience degree to give you a flavor of the types of topics that you're studying on these degree programs. So for example, on a geology degree, you'll, you have, well, you'll study, for example, a module in the dynamic earth. So this is everything from sort of earthquakes, plate tectonics, uh, volcanoes. You'll study paleontology and geohazards. You can choose to study volcanic and mantle processes. So this module here is actually shown in this photograph because it's taught largely as a field class in Tenerife. So you can see the volcano here. You'll learn about mineral resources and carbon storage, exploration, geophysics and remote sensing. You could choose to learn about environmental radioactivity, and so sure, I'm sure Sean will say more about that in a moment. Um, you could choose to study about climate change. Because of where we're based on any of our degrees, we offer modules in seafloor exploration and surveying, and then there's also environmental and engineering geology. If we move on to an environmental geoscience degree, then as I mentioned, this has got either a geoscience pathway or a marine pathway. So that doesn't just affect the type of field work you're doing, but it also uh, affects the types of modules that you could choose to be studying. So on an environmental geoscience degree, you could choose to study modules in global climate change. So understanding the science, the impacts and the policy. You could choose to study air quality and environmental pollution, how humans are adapting to climate change and weather hazards. You could choose to, uh, oh, or you'd study geophysical field methods. So this is actually another module that's run as a field class. So in this case, our environmental geoscientist students are getting practical experience. And actually, how do we how do we actually practically use those geophysical techniques to image what's going on beneath the Earth's surface? You can study water pollution, remote sensing, and then there's more oceanographic modules. So things like ocean data analysis, monitoring coastal and estuarine environments. And then there's modules and things like environmental law and management. And as I mentioned, you could choose to gain oceanographic field skills rather than more land-based field skills. So a geoscience degree, regardless of whether you, where you choose to study geoscience in the UK, will be a very applied degree with lots of field training. So we want to make sure that basically you've got the applied field skills that are required by future employers. And so that's going to involve things like making your own independent observations in the field, or learning to use geophysical survey techniques, either on land or, for example, out at sea. So hopefully I've given you a flavor of what geoscience is. I've told you a bit about what's it like to study here in Southampton. So I thought I'd just uh, finish off before handing over to Sean with talking about, well, what next? What can you actually do with a degree in geoscience? So it's worth mentioning that there are a shortage of qualified environmental geoscientists and geologists in the UK. So this is actually something that's recognized by the UK government. So many geoscience uh, careers are on the UK shortage occupation list. And basically what that means is that there are more jobs available than there are suitably qualified people to fill those jobs. So there's plenty of jobs in geoscience. And so what do those jobs look like? Well, they could be in something like hazard mitigation. So if that was something like coastal hazards, then you might be working for someone like the Environment Agency. If you're more interested in a career in something like volcanic monitoring or earthquake monitoring, then it's more likely you'd work as a researcher in a, in a university and have a job more like mine. There's lots of jobs already in carbon management and sustainable energy, and that's only going to increase in the future. Something I've not really mentioned in this talk is that geoscientists are also involved in sustainable mineral extraction. So Basically, if we want to drive electric cars like this, if we all want to own mobile phones, if we want to watch webinars on uh, computer screens, tablets, on phones, whatever, then actually we have to extract the materials and minerals to make those, uh, to, to create those technologies. But also, you know, we are custodians of this planet. And so as geoscientists, we're responsible for actually finding sustainable ways to do that. Uh, some of our students go into hydrogeology, so this is things like actually ensuring that populations have clean uh, drinking water supplies. Land, land management and remediation is a really big employer, so if you think about all the pollutants that humans have put into the environment, whether that's microplastics in the oceans, or for chemical pollution, or, or uh, nuclear pollution on land or in the sea, then actually we need geoscientists to work out actually how do we get rid of those pollutants or, or learn to live with them. And then a, a massive employer for our students is actually in geotechnical surveying. So basically 
any time we build anything on the surface of the earth, whether that's a road or a wind farm, then actually we need to know what the uh, land beneath the earth's surface looks like. For. And so we need uh, geoscientists to do this. So I hope that I've given you a flavour of um, uh, what geoscience is like, what it's like to study at university, and also the types of careers you can go into with a degree in geoscience. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Sean, and Sean's going to give you his perspective of what it was like to study in Southampton and what he's doing now. So I should say, so Sean studied the four-year integrated uh, master's programme in geology with us. So I will stop sharing and hand over to you, Sean. Thank you very much, Esther. And just my turn to share my slides. There we go. Right. Um, so yeah. So hi everyone. Yeah, I'm I'm Sean. I'm a I'm a PhD student here at the University of Southampton. Um, I I did my undergraduate here as well as Esther said, uh, doing an integrated masters in geology. I actually started off on the bachelor's for the geology, um, and then and then switched over to the masters in my second year. Uh, and so I'm going to be talking today about some of the things I got to do during my undergraduate, uh, some of the experiences I had and how that's um, taken me on to where I am today, some of the skills I've, I've developed over that time and uh, how I took some of those forward. Uh, so it's quite difficult to kind of sum up four years in, in a few minutes. Um, so I thought I'd sort of pick out four uh, images that were particularly kind of um, uh, that sort of stuck out in my mind. So uh, the first one, uh, this top left photo. So this is uh, this was the first field trip we ever went on. Uh, so this was to Tenby in Wales, and uh, and I think, uh, unsurprisingly, I suppose for for a geoscience degree, for a geology degree, yeah, field trips are a big part of it. Um, and it's really nice as well because it's a good opportunity to get to know those in the cohort that perhaps didn't have so much to do with previously, um, and. It's a really nice opportunity. It's kind of a great sort of bonding experience as a group and with certain individuals as well. So uh, me and my friend here, um, we, we were excited on the day because it was one of the first days and it'd been raining all morning and we just got excited because it was the first time uh, that we could take our hoods off for the day. Um, but it's those sort of experiences that kind of make friends for life, really. So uh, the, the reason I picked this photo is because um, uh, my friend in this photo, I was best man at his wedding last year. So, you know, it's, it's not the sort of thing where you just kind of get to know people for a few years and then that's it and then they disappear. Um, you know, you, you really do make friends um, uh, in the long term. Um, then bottom right, this photo was uh, from another field trip. This was from the Spain field trip. Uh, so this was a nice example of, of something uh, you don't necessarily get to see every day. This was a um, uh, what's commonly referred to as a garnet volcano. So this is a volcano that uh, when it was active, as well as erupting magma, like most volcanoes do, you also have a, uh, you know, this this particular volcano also brought up garnets, so these purple semi-precious gemstones, um, and then with, with the magma uh, from deep within the earth, the, the garnets came up as well. So again, it is something really nice. It's it's an opportunity to see something that you wouldn't normally, and you know, reading about something in textbooks, reading about, you know, hearing about them in lectures is one thing, but actually getting to, I mean, uh, physically hands on um, is 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 something that is is really neat. Um, and so it also was good fun the last sort of half an hour or so of the day, everyone running around saying you can find the biggest guy on it as well. Uh, then top right, so this is a photo I took. This is from a, a microscope slide in one of the paleobiology practicals. So this was um, some insects that were um, trapped in amber. So I'm sure you've all heard of amber before. It's essentially just ancient tree sap um, from particular trees that, that produced a, a, lot, a lot of sap. Um, and unfortunately, these poor critters um, got a bit unlucky, ended up getting stuck in the amber and were completely encapsulated um, and completely trapped. And so were exceptionally preserved for hundreds of millions of years. Um, and whilst it's unfortunate for them, it's it's great for us. It's, it's a great way of being able to study, um, being able to study species from long, long ago uh, and, and being able to get hands on. Again, that sort of seeing them in a PowerPoint show is, is one thing but but having them right in front of you being able to see them in hand specimen and then also uh, uh under a microscope slide as well and, and not just um different uh, animals as well a lot of uh rock sort of thin sections what we call microscope slides um uh, are really sort of useful to, to kind of get that hands-on experience uh, and then finally uh, in the bottom right this image um it, this is this is a weird looking thing this is called the chart of the nuclides so I'm sure you've all, um, you're all used to the periodic table from chemistry lessons. 
um, which shows every chemical element that we know of. Um, the chart of the nuclides is essentially the periodic table on steroids. So this shows this shows every single isotope that we know of. So the reason I've got this in here is because this was something I learned about in a third year module, um, as Esther sort of mentioned briefly earlier, uh, looking at environmental radioactivity. And so um, everything in the universe is ever so slightly radioactive. But understanding how some of those radioactive um, uh, radioactive elements, what we call radionuclides, how they might interact with the environment um, and, and the sort of consequences and processes of both natural radionuclides and also man-made radionuclides um, was, was something that really interested me when I took this module in third year. Um, and it was it was something a bit different. I hadn't necessarily considered ra environmental radioactivity as really something I could have done in geology. It wasn't a reason I signed up for this degree. Um, but it was the sort of thing that I found, actually, I really enjoyed it. So I'd quite like to take this further, which then led me on to my fourth year. So I sort of learned about this in third year. And then in fourth year, you have uh, the master's projects, the independent research project. So this is an opportunity to do a bit of proper science, really. Uh, this is an opportunity to essentially do some work that potentially no one's ever done before and really kind of make your mark on, on science. So my, my sort of project was looking at uh, the removal of technetium from groundwater at nuclear sites. So when you have a nuclear power plant, and it's come to the end of its life, it's no longer producing power, the land needs to be uh, returned back to regular use. Understandably, everything has to be cleaned up, and that includes things like groundwaters and soils. Um, and technetium can be a common contaminant at nuclear sites. So uh, my master's project was looking at whether we could use this particular type of chemical framework, um, essentially a powder. It's, you, you've got a, an image there in the, in the center of the slide kind of showing re in reality what it looks like. Um, and the idea is, can you pass some contaminated groundwater through this powder? Um, the technetium sticks to the powder and then the clean water uh, passes out the other side. So the, the project was sort of certainly in terms of the practical side of things was broken down into two parts for me. So the summer between my third and fourth year, I got to uh, make the framework. This was up at the chemistry department. So this was on Highfield campus. So as Esther said, we're sort of mainly based down at Knox. Um, but it was really nice to kind of see a different side of the university, different department, uh, the different equipment and facilities they had. Um, I got to, sort of, as I say, spend a few days up there. Um, and then throughout fourth year, bringing that framework back to NOC, being able to test it and getting to use some of the facilities uh, here instead. So this image on the right here is, uh, is a mass spectrometer. So um, and those of you that have studied chemistry have probably heard about it before. Uh, essentially, it's able to work out the concentration of uh, different elements that, that um, uh, when you put a sample through it. So the idea there is that we didn't actually use technetium in the end because it is radioactive. We used a non-radioactive equivalent, uh, rhenium. Um, so essentially we were measuring how much rhenium uh, got stuck uh, on this framework throughout fourth year. So uh, this was really this was really cool, to be honest. It was the sort of thing I really enjoyed this lab work um, and also being able to work more independently as well, being sort of um, moving away from kind of the more traditional lectures um, and studying, which of course there still was in fourth year, but being able to get more independent, being able to do your own thing um, and being able to take those lab skills and, and kind of thinking, yeah, actually, this is something I really enjoy. I want to keep this going. Um, and so that, that led me on to where I am today. So this led me on to uh, the PhD. So I'm now actually working in a very similar department. My uh, supervisor who uh, my PhD supervisor, who was also my master supervisor, uh, funnily enough, was also uh, the professor that gave the lectures in that third year module that, that really kind of inspired me to go down this route. Um, uh, so you can kind of see how, how it's all sort of uh, wrapped up into one neat kind of package, really. Uh, my PhD is looking at a process called electrokinetics. Um, so the, if I can just get a pointer up, there we are. So yeah, electrokinetics, it's essentially, it's a bit of a weird word, but breaks down into two main parts, electro being electricity and then kinetics being movement. So the idea is essentially, if I have a material that has radioactive contaminants in it, whether it be uh, concrete or uh, some groundwater, some soil, something like that, can I essentially electrocute the material and move those radioactive contaminants from the inside to the outside? So some of the things I now get to do, I'm fortunate enough to say I can get to do on a daily basis. There's plenty of lab work to be done. Um, 
Uh, and then what we've got here is this image in, in the bottom is kind of a, a realistic setup of, of the electrokinetics kind of uh, some of my, my lab experiments. Being able to use the facilities that we have down at Knox is really nice and being able to use them throughout my master's project as well. I mean, there's a lot of labs in the building. It's, it's nice to be able to get in and actually use them rather than just sort of peering into a window in the door going, oh, that's cool, and then never being able to use them. Um, you know, trying to get students in as much as I can is, is something that the university is really keen on. Um, and then it's, it's not just about doing the research for me, it's also about presenting these things. Um, so there's there's a couple of, of ways that I go about presenting my research. So the first one, the bottom right, is writing papers. So um, writing scientific papers that, that will go into uh, certain journals as well, being able to get my work out there. Um, and then also this, this image uh, sort of center right with me um, uh, at a conference. So uh, conference is just being where basically lots of scientists get together and tell each other about the research they've done. I was fortunate enough last year to be able to go to Arizona and so uh, uh, for a conference. And so yeah, there was me on the Arizona Nevada um, uh, border in the US, which was which was really cool. And it was an opportunity that I didn't really, I, I don't think I'd have had otherwise. So being able to take a lot of the a lot of the skills that I gained, particularly in the master's projects, a lot of that independent working, um, and being able to take that forward as well in combination with the facilities that they have here um, at Southampton has has been yeah uh, incredible really. And yeah, I think looking back to that third year uh, lecture, sitting in, going, oh, that's quite interesting. Um, a PhD was never really something I seriously considered. I think until I, I started doing the master's project and did that work up at Highfield, it was never something I'd ruled out. But it was, it wasn't something my heart was set on until until that fourth year. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, I think in short, yeah, definitely for, for me it was absolutely the right call. Um, uh, and I think it's a nice example of, of like as to be saying how broad some of the. Um, uh, how broad a geology degree can be. It pulls on a, on a number of different sort of topics. And so as a result, you can branch off into a number of different fields. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Um, thank you very much for listening and I'll pass back to Esther. Sharing, here yeah. Hi. Uh, so actually, I think uh, Freddie is going to sort of compare the question and answer session. It's great. We've seen lots of questions coming in to us. So yeah. I'll, I'll hand over to Freddie, actually. Yeah, it's been really, really good. And first, firstly, I just want to thank Sean and Esther for your contributions there. Um, yeah, really excellent. And Sean, always great to kind of hear, obviously brings it to life more as well when we actually see what you've been up to. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for sharing. Um, thanks as well, students, because we've got lots of questions coming through and we are going to spend the next 15 minutes answering those so uh, please do keep them coming uh, but Esther I know you've had an eye on some of these so I wondered whether perhaps Katie's if you wanted to start there I wasn't sure um, yeah maybe we should introduce Stephanie and encourage that if anybody's got any questions sort of that they want to put to one of our students because a lot of these questions at the moment are, are questions which I'll answer but if you want sort of a student perspective in your answer then they uh, Stephanie or Sean would be the people to do that. So maybe Stephanie, if you could just tell people who you are and what you do just briefly. <laughs> oh, uh, hi, I'm Stephanie, obviously. <laughs> and I do environmental geoscience. And I just started my third year. And I'm also on the MSI pathway as well. Incredible. Super. Great shout, okay, Esther. So, Thanks, Stephanie. Um, there's a couple of questions, which are basically, uh, can you just do these jobs with a geography degree? Can you do a geography degree to do a career in geoscience? Uh, so I guess I might just share a slide to answer that because it's something that comes up has come up for me before. OK. So hopefully what you'll be able to see is so this this so this slide is for my admissions talk. So this is really comparing geology, environmental geoscience and geography degrees at the University of Southampton. But um, a lot of what I'll say is, is kind of relevant regardless of the university. So I say, so first of all, I'll start with what's the difference between, <laughs> sounds like a joke, what's the difference between a geology degree and a geography degree? And then I'll go on to, you know, what kind of careers can you do with those different degrees? So geology, as I've mentioned, physical aspects of the Earth system, environmental geoscience, human interactions with the Earth system. And there's certainly overlap, particularly between environmental geoscience and environmental science degrees and physical geography degrees. Environmental science would be more about sustainability in the environment. Physical geography 
uh, most people are familiar with physical geography from school. So things like landscapes, ecology, sustainability, tending to focus on the surface of the earth. And then obviously geography might combine human and physical geography. Um, I guess telling you about sort of entry requirements, certainly to our degrees, gives you a hint as to sort of the scientific content of those degrees. So for example, geology and environmental geoscience require two different science subjects to get in, whereas environmental science and physical geography one. Also in terms of sort of how applied the degrees are. So if you want loads and loads of field training, then I would go for something like a geology degree. Uh, environmental geoscience also has lots of field training. Uh, environmental science and geography can do. And I think when you're choosing what degree to do, a lot of it is about actually look at what field, where are people giving you field training? What is that field training? How much of it is there? Because uh, that will vary among universities. So I guess that's trying to give you a flavor of what's the difference between geology and geography. In terms of careers, it kind of depends on what's the career and also what specific degree did you do? Um, because let's say uh, you want to go into some kind of environmental management, then it might well be possible to do that with a geography degree. But let's say you're interested in monitoring volcanic hazards or earthquake hazards or something, then that probably wouldn't be possible with a geography degree because that's something really which is part of geology. So geography tends to be really focused more on the surface of the Earth's atmosphere, whereas geology really goes more into kind of depth about how does our planet's interior work. And then I think, yeah, in terms of careers, a lot of it is really looking at on a degree program, what type of training are you getting? So I know, for example, in our geography department, you'll get modules in remote sensing in here in the School of Earth Science. We'll also give you um, modules in remote sensing. So hopefully that gives you a flavour of, of uh, the difference between geology and geography. Without me being too rude about geography. So. Thanks so much, Esther. I'll try and stop sharing. Stephanie, what did you get up to before Southampton? Did you go straight into your degree? Because we've got a question here about gap years and whether to defer and things like that. I didn't take a gap year, but that was because we were still having all the confusion about COVID. And I thought it might not actually be worth it because I'm not really sure what I can even do in a gap year. So I just came straight to um, uni. <laughs> <laughs> And, and was your kind of perceptions of what life would be like and also your your kind of course area uh, any different to what happened when you arrived? I mean, it was like how I thought it would be like, to be honest. Um, the only thing is that to, in halls, everyone told me I'd make friends in halls, but I actually made my friends on the course, which I think is a oh, bit different cool. than what everyone said. So, so there's been a social loved. element to your studies as well. Yeah, I'd say all most of my friends are from my course and not just environmental geoscience, but from ge geology as well. So. Fantastic. And what, what are your kind of career aspirations once you finish? Um, I'm still working on that at the moment. <laughs> and so I, I changed from the bachelor's to the master's to give me a bit of extra time to figure it out and to extend it further. I mean, at the moment, I'm quite interested in the geophysics, but I'm still seeing you know, what I want to do. Absolutely. And what advice would you have for sort of prospective students um, in terms of, you know, gaining different experiences and an insight into different career fields while you're at university? I'd say definitely recommend to do an internship during the summer. I'd say I did one this summer, which was just in an office. So, you know, next summer I might look to do something more like in a lab or hands-on to see what kind of career area I want to go into. So... And also, yeah, just trying to get involved with the different, you know, talk to your lecturers and stuff as well is quite important. <laughs> yeah, is that is that how you found out about doing the internship that you got, or was that through a different means? Well, my tutor encouraged me to get one, and he recommended places to email and how to get in contact with them to be able to find someone to do an internship with. Excellent. I think it's a really worthwhile thing to do. Um, and we have just had another question through for you, Stephanie, in terms of like the decision making process, uh, studying your course, like how was that for you? Well, I always, I took uh, geography A level and I always really liked physical geography and I was going to take geology A level, but I decided not to in the end because I didn't want to take four. And I just kind of looked up <laughs> degrees to do that kind of like geography, but more with physical and I really was interested in vol volcanics and stuff and it just kind of led me to this degree and then I was like yeah that sounds like a bit of geography a bit of geology a bit of 
environment and stuff as well. So that's how I ended up here. Follow your interests. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, just just a quick one here, Stephanie, before we move on. Uh, someone was just asking out of interest what A-levels you took. You mentioned I, your... I did physics, geography and music. Okay, nice, nice. Um, so real mix. Mm. Um, so um, I was positive I saw one in here um, for Sean, and I'm pretty sure it was around kind of how you <clears throat> split your time and also uh, what work experience you would recommend. Obviously, Stephanie's been talking about internships, but is there anything else students can be thinking about to sort of enhance their career prospects and also just get a taste for different fields? Yeah, so uh, I, yeah, I guess I guess to, to reiterate what Stephanie said, uh, the first thing is if internships are available, then you know it, it's it's the sort of thing that, that's relevant to a kind of field you're interested in. That's always really good. Um, being able to even even just on a CV, being able to say I've been in the lab or I've been in the field or something like that can make things look good. Uh, you know, it, perhaps I'm thinking more about once you're at uni. I suppose, because um, the other thing I'd always recommend as well, um, I say quite a lot, again, perhaps perhaps once you're into university, is um, volunteering in the labs. So Southampton, and, and certainly down at, at Knox, um, if it's the sort of thing where you're interested in a particular area, particularly after you've done some, some, some modules and you've got, yeah, this is really interesting, then um, normally if, uh, if it's possible to get students into the lab, then normally staff are more than happy to... Uh, and like technicians are normally more than happy to, to get people in, uh, to get students in. And, you know, it might be the sort of thing where you do it and go, oh, this is really cool. Um, I really want to do this. Or it might be the sort of thing where you go, God, that was, you know, it's not for me. I don't want to do that area again. You know, sometimes knowing what you don't want to do is as important as knowing what you do want to do. Um, so, yeah, I definitely recommend um, sort of internships and volunteering. Um, uh, and particularly, again, sort of, Jumping back to the question of of gap years and you know whether you want to do a gap year or not, personally, I I didn't before I started my undergraduate, but that might be the sort of thing where maybe it's worth potentially deferring for the year or or waiting another year um, before you come to university, being able to get some um, sort of industry experience or something like that as well might might be a really good opportunity to if again if nothing else boost the CV. Um, and you know, it might be the sort of thing where you find, yeah, this is really cool, and now I want to go on and study it further. So I think they're probably the two angles I recommend. Yeah, and definitely kind of boosting your preparedness. And I guess the more prepared you are, the more you'll get out of your degrees and your your studies as well. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I've, I think so. I think I found the question. Uh, I think it's in the question that you're on about as well. In terms of, so just to answer the sort of second bit about. Um, uh, what I'm doing at the moment. So, so I'm I'm a PhD student at the moment. So I'm mainly sort of research based. Um, I'm, I'm I'm doing research, as I said, on on electrokinetics. I am in my final year now, which is which is scary to say and scary to think about. But uh, but there we are. Future comes for everyone. And uh, so I'm hoping after to kind of uh, to go out and get a job, hopefully uh, in the nuclear industry. I'd quite like to stick with remediation and and sort of clean up. Um, of, of sort of nuclear sites um, but uh, yeah watch this space I guess is uh, for that one okay. your options open exactly um, I saw a question here on student shadowing programs and excuse my ignorance but I wasn't familiar with those um, is that something that Southampton offer for prospective students it's not something that we typically do we occasionally take work experience students um but it's, I, I think it's as Sean says, actually, it's something that's probably better to do once you're sort of doing a degree and then shadowing members of staff or PhD students in the lab, because you have, you kind of have a better idea of what interests you and you've probably got a, a better level of knowledge to sort of really sort of appreciate that experience would be my, my answer to that. And I know that I guess I'm going to make I don't know, maybe a controversial statement, comment on personal statements here, but I know as an admissions tutor, every single open day, I have students coming to me and parents who are, you know, think the uh, personal statement is the most important thing in the world and that you need to have traveled around the globe, looked at every single volcano and done all this work experience. And actually, no, what we really want to know is that you're interested in doing the degree, that you're passionate about it. 
And that doesn't matter if you've kind of, you know, been to Iceland or not. It, it's just about telling us, you know, why you're interested. Maybe you're studying at A-level, you know, maybe you live in a nice area, but, you know, you, you, so I guess that would be my comment on student shadowing is certainly if it's something which you're worried about for say a personal statement, I, I would not worry about it. Just, just on that note, Esther, is there anything in particular um, that you've seen in the past in students' applications that's made them really stand out? You know, that's a good question. I think it's, I think it's the tone to me. I, I can think of examples that have done the opposite. So definitely do put some effort into your personal statement. It will count against you if you don't. But um, I think sometimes it's just been. Uh, so if somebody some something like an EPQ is quite interesting that they normally have, you know, some quite in-depth knowledge on a particular topic. And it's quite interesting to include that. Not that you need an EPQ to do that. It might be something you've seen a documentary about or read about that just says, oh, yeah, this person's actually really, really kind of interested and engaged in this subject. I think that's 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 the kind of thing that's I find interesting looking at, at personal statements. Yeah, no, I think I think worthwhile advice there and um, a nice thing for students to be thinking about, because I think a lot of what we've mentioned is when is once students have actually got onto their degree. But I think obviously it's really important, you know, to get onto the best next step that you're you're really thinking as a student, how you can really stand out in applications. Um, and Stephanie spoken well as, as well around kind of the decision making process. And if there is that interest and passion there, that's going to come through, isn't it? So I think following your interests and that kind of thing um, is really important. And also, uh, I think career, there's been a lot of chat, obviously, across this as well around, you know, career opportunities and prospects, which is obviously another key consideration. Um, we are just about running out of time. Um, but what I thought, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a few really key next steps, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, for students here today. One of them would be heading on to Unifrog uh, because we do have a UK university search tool on there and all of Southampton's um, courses um, are listed on there and there's really smart ways that you can start to search and compare those by subject areas. Um, and then I think secondly, you know, if you would like to learn more um, about Southampton, we've got open days coming up and then uh, I've put Esther's um, email address in there as well and I'm sure she'd be very happy to receive any questions that you might have uh, equally for, for Sean and Stephanie, I'm sure they can be passed on as well. Um, and then we will have the recording available as well. So uh, I'm going to be handing that to the team at Southampton and we'll be able to get that across to all of you that signed up as well, uh, including potentially PowerPoints, Esther. Would that be OK? Uh, I think that should be OK. Poss yeah. Possibly, once you've had a look at them. Yeah, I just need to check. <laughs> <laughs> And Stephanie, what do you think if there are any students that wanted to get in touch with you? Are there any means to do that? Or would it be best to go through Esther? I mean, you can have my email if you want to. Yeah. yeah Should fine. we get that? Should we get that round as well? We can do that in, in follow up for attendees today and perhaps the same for you, Sean, as well, if that's OK. Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Apologies, we're out of time. Uh, but amazing session. And thanks, Esther, Stephanie and Sean for taking time out of your day um, to deliver because it's been excellent. And uh, to the sort of 80 odd students we've had along as well. Thanks for all of your questions um, and hope to see you again on the next one. Thanks, everyone.